Hey, this is Pastor Waller. I want to thank you so much for joining us for worship this morning. I want to remind you, we need poll workers here in Pennsylvania, and I want to encourage you to find out how you can be a part of standing up polling sites all over the city, all over the state. If you're interested, please go to our website and find out more information about how to be a poll worker. Well, this morning we're talking about hope. We're talking about the basis of our hope and the efficacy of our hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I want to challenge you to review how it is and what makes you get up in the morning. The reason I get up is because I know the Lord has something for me to do. Come on, let's talk about it this morning in worship. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Come on, let's go to God in prayer as we prepare for the word of God. God, I love you and I thank you. I thank you for another opportunity to worship you, to hear your word. I thank you, God, for the blessed promises of your presence in our lives. And now, God, we turn to hear word from you. I have studied, but I need your strength. Prepared, but I need your power. Willing, and I want to, but only you can make me able. Silently now, I wait for thee. Ready, my Lord, thy will to see, open mine eyes and illumine me. Spirit divine, amen. Amen. Bless and thank our God for the choir and thank our God for another opportunity to dig into the word. I'd like to invite you again to one verse from our passage of scripture, verse that is all well known to all of us, found in Philippians, the first chapter and the sixth verse, you'll find these words. Being confident of being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord, and I want to talk to you from a subject, it shall come to pass. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. It shall come to pass. It shall come to pass. You know, I don't, I don't know what you've been doing with your six months of seclusion. Um, but one of the things that I've been doing as I, I think about life and think about changes and think about development of myself, um, you all can remember last year around Christmas, I tried to play the trumpet and uh, back Thanksgiving, tried to play the trumpet and I, I, I blew it, you know, I blew the horn. And, um, but I have really taken some time to really dig into the instrument and in fact, I've made a commitment to myself and to the art that the trumpet's going to be my instrument for this season of life. I'm working on it and I'm taking lessons and I'm really trying to apply it. It's also about a lifestyle change for me. Trumpet being a part of the band, not necessarily out front. Um, I've had my season of out front. I just want to be in the horn section want to learn and and quite frankly I've got a goal I've got a goal you all know there's a there's there's a band in town it's called UGO uh, Urban Guerrilla Orchestra and that's kind of Philly's own uh, Earth Wind and Fire well I, I plan on playing in that band now I'm not good enough today I, I can't get in today they won't let me in today but I'm, I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep working at it I'm going to keep working at it. I'm going to work on it. And, and one day you're going to look up. It'll be about three years from now. You're going to look up and see me with UGO because I'm going to make it and I'm going to play in that band. Now, now part, of, part of why I just told you that is because I understand motivation for me. And what gets me up in the morning is, you know, having something to do, having a reward, enjoyable reward at the end of it. I know that by telling you that, um, there's a certain amount of motivation that I'm going to have that uh, is just because I just put it out there. And this sermon has nothing to do with trumpets and music, but it has 
to do with you looking at your life in a, a granular way about what motivates you, what, what keeps you going, what makes you get up, what will cause you not to give up. I mean, right now, the, the trumpet for me is hard. My lips are old. They get tired. I can't play too high. My fingers are old. I'm not moving too fast. Parts of me says it's too late. I'm too old. I want to quit. But uh, there's something in me that says, no, you're going to make it. And I honestly believe I am. But the question for you as you look at your life and as you look at things that you are dealing with, what are the, the granular pieces of your life that you need in order to make it? in order to get up tomorrow, in order to not throw in the towel, in order to not determine that you're too old or that you're too far gone. I guess what I'm really talking about is something even up under all of that, and it's, it's hope. Where does your hope come from? Where do you derive that sense that you're going to make it? There's a concept called hope, the uh, hope theory that basically says there's an interaction between your agency and pathways, obstacles, and outcomes. When you are hopeful, you believe in your agency and you see a pathway and you can negotiate obstacles so that you get your outcome. When you don't have hope, you can't see your agency, you don't perceive any pathways, and you magnify obstacles, and you never get to your outcomes. It's a dangerous place to live when you're hopeless. It's a dangerous thing to be because when you are hopeless, hopelessness leads to apathy. Hopelessness need, leads to cynicism. Hopelessness leads to people saying, I don't want to vote and I'm not going to vote because it doesn't make any difference. Hopelessness leads to people believing that because someone is not perfect, they don't deserve any support. Hopelessness destroys community. Hopelessness drives crime. When you look in our community sometimes, the nature of crime suggests that not only is it crime, but it is crime that is coming out of a hopelessness, some who have given up. But I stopped by to tell you, this ain't the time to be hopeless. This ain't the time to believe you can't do it. This is not the time to believe it's uh, throw in the towel time. This is the time that you've got to remind yourself that it shall come to pass. This is the time that you have to remind yourself it may be difficult, but I know God's got my back. This is the time that you have to remind yourself that God did not bring you this far to leave you now. Somebody text your neighbor and say, it shall come to pass. That's what I want to talk about. That's what I want to talk about. It shall, it shall come to pass. You know, Paul is writing. I love the book of Philippians, and we're going to walk with it for a while. Paul is writing to his first church. The Philippian church is what Paul started first. And and he loves them. Paul now has an ankle bracelet. He's on house arrest. And Paul is at the end of his journey. Put a pin right there and I'll be back. He writes this wonderful letter of encouragement. And it's important to understand that what Paul is writing to, he, he writes to them to steer clear of the far left or the far right. In fact, when you understand the book of Philippians, he is fighting against the Judaizers on one hand, that's the far right, and the antinomianism or the libertines on the left, that's the far left. He fights against those perspectives and reminds them to find their hope in the one who started it all. He reminds them not to give up. Yes, he's thanking them for what he, he's thanking the Philippians for what they've done for him, but he reminds them to stay faithful and not even to let the fact that he's in jail detour them from continuing to be faithful. He says, don't, don't worry about what you see going on in me. Don't worry about what seems to have happened to me because the truth of the matter is the one that has begun a good work in us is going to complete it. 
It's going to come to pass. And I think I just need to tell somebody today that if God started a thing in you, and even if it doesn't look right right now, you need to hold on to his unchanging hand. You can't throw in the towel now. You've come too far. You've cried too much. You've experienced too much. God will bring it to pass. Well, there's a couple of things in the text. That's what, that's what Paul says. He says, we're, I'm confident. I'm confident that he that has uh, started this thing is going to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The first thing that comes up in the text for me, and that is if I'm going to see it come to pass, number one, I have to carry myself with confidence. Yeah, you need to carry yourself with confidence. If you are a child of God, you ought to act like it. If you are a child of God, I'm not talking about arrogance, but the gate of a Christian ought to be the gate of one who knows it's going to be all right. We don't walk around defeated. We don't walk around scared. We walk around knowing that we have somebody on our side. We walk around knowing that, that the race isn't given to the swift or to the strong. We walk around knowing that God will fight our battles. We are confident. Uh, you know, the young Abrahams, my, uh, the ministry that I love working with the young boys from seven to nine years old, young Abrahams, we have a call and response every time we get together. When we get together, I will say, we are the young Abrahams and we display and they will all say back to me, confidence. And then I will say, we display confidence because we shake with thee and they'll say right hand. And then I'll say, we shake with the right hand because the right hand and then they will say is the hand of honor, resource and commitment. Then we follow it up by saying we do not tell Pastor Waller what we cannot do. We do not tell Pastor Waller what is impossible because we can, they will say, we can do all things through Christ. That's it. That's it. Every time we get together, that's the mantra. That is the call and response because I'm wanting those young boys to grow up knowing that things are possible for them, that they can do it. Why? Because C.A.W. Clark once said that 80% of can't do is don't want to and don't want to usually wears a mask of scared to. I'm going to try it again. 80% of can't do is don't want to and don't want to is usually a mask on top of scared to. And when you are scared to, you don't want to. And when you don't want to, you can't do. But if you know that you can't lose, then you'll keep on going. I need you to understand that confidence is a noun. It is a state of being. It is both trust in and trust that. It is trust in truth that is abiding. And it is trust that that truth is efficacious. I think I just said something. Something. You need to know that when you are confident, you use I statements like this. I am not alone. I, I know there is a resolution. This will work out. I, I can handle this. This shall come to pass. Confidence is knowing uh, that we serve a God who has not left us alone. Confidence is speaking those things that are not as though they are. Are, am I talking to anybody here? Uh, you know, uh, our president uh, got caught in yet another lie. And he called himself being confident. Uh, he called himself being confident because he didn't want to tell the truth. When the truth of the matter is, Mr. President, I understand that when you are the leader, you don't show how the sausage is made. I understand that, but you do call it sausage. When you are the leader, it's not that you don't tell the truth. You tell the truth, but you follow it up by, but we have uh, the greatest doctors in the world, but we have a solution. But since you failed at that, let me remind you that when you are a leader, Mr. President, you remind people how difficult the road is, but you remind them that we've got something. And I stopped by to tell somebody today that if you are a child of God, and if there is an assignment on your life, you need to know the devil is after you. I'm not going to rose color it. You need to know that for every new level, there is a new 
devil, you need to know that when the Lord starts blessing, the devil is going to start messing. You need to know the closer you get to your glory, the more you will fall under attack. You need to know that it gets dark before the new day. You need to know uh, that when the enemy comes in like a flood, here it is. The Lord will set up a standard in front of you. I'll tell you the truth. You're going to cry sometimes, but God will wipe your tears away. I tell you the truth. You're going to lose some friends, but God will bring somebody new into your life. I tell you the truth. They, the enemy will come in, but God will fight your battles. I am confident. I am confident that God has got my back. I am confident that I'm coming up out of this. You need to be confident. In fact, you know, the beauty of a Christian, I, I, I'm going to get in trouble, but I'm going to go on there. Do you know, uh, do you know why uh, the words of moderation, that the words of moderation and not adornment are thrown around in the New Testament? And I know I'm, I'm about to get in trouble, uh, but do you know uh, that the reason that Paul tells the women uh, don't don't let your beauty be that of the plaited hair and all the gold and the earrings and then the general discussion of uh, moderation for men and women is to not to seek your beauty in outward expression and and do you know why that that really is because God knew and understood and built into the very human fabric that there's something attractive about just being confident that there's something very there, there's something very winsome about somebody who knows who they are. Uh, let me see if I can make this thing plain. Do y'all remember? And maybe you were him. Maybe maybe, maybe you were him. Do you y'all remember being in school with that guy? And he was he's he's kind of fat, maybe. And I know that's politically incorrect. But but wasn't he wasn't all the athlete and all that, just kind of big. But he had the fine girlfriend. Y'all remember him? I mean, maybe maybe he was kind of a nerdy kind of cat, but but he still had a fine girlfriend. Y'all remember him? Do you remember there was something about how cool he was? There was something about the confidence that he had. You need to understand that there's something attractive about getting up in the morning, looking into the mirror, and being able to say that the person you see in the mirror is one in, in the in the mirror has been wondrously and marvelously made in God's image. Looking in the mirror and being confident that there's nothing that will happen today that me and God can not handle. You need to tell yourself, I am confident. I'm confident that God has not left me. I am confident that I will see this thing come to pass. I am confident that God will fix it. I am confident that this will work out for his glory and for my good. Well, he says, we are confident. But if you're going to be confident and you're going to see this thing come to pass, then you need to recognize that your confidence is in Christ. I, I know that usually when we preach as preachers, we king, we bring Jesus into the text at the third point, kicking and screaming on our way out. But I want to dig in right here. Our confidence is in Christ. Now, I've got some problem with the grammar in here because that he uh, is a lowercase he. But when you read the sentence, it is clear that the he is a personal pronoun. Jesus' personal pronoun is he. Prefer as preference of pronoun is he. Uh, and the he is the reference to the one who started the whole thing. It is he. It is Jesus. My understanding of the text and my commitment and my confidence is not in all the outer trappings of the world or even my religion. My confidence is in him. That he in the text is Jesus. Is that he in the text is God as revealed through Jesus Christ. And I need to sit down right here because my confidence this morning is concretely in Jesus the Christ. Uh, now, now, let me help you understand. Uh, my confidence is not in a political party. My confidence is not in the right or the left wing. My confidence is not, well, let me get in trouble. My confidence is not in this church. My confidence is not necessarily in this book. My confidence is not in my religion. My confidence is in Jesus. Now, I just said a mouthful. Let me unpack it. Uh, you know, I've 
I, I took a chance on Tuesday night and, uh, and during Bible study, I went into some source criticism. You know, we pointed out that uh, there are two names for Jethro in the Bible, and there is Ruel and Jethro. Uh, and I, I trusted you enough to know that we acknowledge the textual problems of the canonization of the Bible. I know somebody's getting, getting nervous now, but, and I, I, want, I want you to understand that if you're going to go deeper into the book, you've got to wrestle with some of the challenges of the Bible, and you've got to wrestle with some of the textual challenges of the Bible. And, and if I just sat back, and if I just read the 1,500-year uh, history of the Bible, and if I just read the 1,500-year process of canonization, there's some problems in there. And, and if I were to just read the history of the Christian church as a black man, I, I, I'll accept the fact that it starts out in black hands, but it gets snatched out of black hands. And, and, and at times, my story as a black man uh, can, be, can be taken over by a white supremacy that informs a Western culture that problematizes our in, an understanding of the text. And so that it becomes difficult to call yourself a Christian if you just read the history sometimes. And, and, and it becomes difficult to have all of this confidence in texts that clearly have some challenges. And, and, and as a church, as an institution, when I think about church folk, when I think about church folk, come on, tell the truth, text them, just say church folk. When you think about church folk and some of the challenges, the mendacity and hypocrisy that we all embody at times and, and the hurt that we cause each other and the misinformation that happens, that, that can cause you, if, if you're not careful, to, to lose confidence in, in church and lose confidence in religion and lose confidence in the text. But that's why, that, that's why my confidence is not in that. Oh, I believe that the Bible is the word of God. I really do. And I believe in being a Christian. I'm pr pr proud to call myself a Christian. I, I believe in being Baptist. And I'm, I'm, I love being the pastor of the Enon Tabernacle Baptist Church. But that's all not because of it on its merit. It's because of him. You need to understand my, my faith is in Jesus. My faith is in Jesus. Why? Because I wasn't there when they wrote the Bible. I wasn't there over that 1500 year period. I got some questions and I, I haven't been around for the 2000 years that of, of the formation of the Christian church. And I, I've only been at Enon for 26 years. I haven't been around for all 145 of those years. And so I can't speak to the credibility of everything in all of those. But I was there when I met Jesus. I, I need you to understand. And it is Jesus that told me that the Bible is the word of God. Yes, it is. It is Jesus that told me uh, that the church is his and that upon this rock he will build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail again. It was Jesus. You need to understand that Jesus is not just a postulation to me. Jesus is not just a, a, a belief system. Jesus is a real historic figure who showed up in my life. He died on a Friday and got up early Sunday morning with all power in his hands and has shown himself to me. That's why it really doesn't matter what happens. It really doesn't matter for me what happens if somebody in church messes up. It really doesn't matter if somebody makes you mad. It really doesn't matter if somebody points out some problem with the text. It really doesn't matter if somebody shows me something in history because my faith is based in a fact. You see, you need to understand that I'm not in here this morning preaching because of the history. I'm in here preaching because I met Jesus. I'm not in here this morning because of the Baptist church. I'm not in here this morning because of my mother or my father. I'm in here because I heard his voice. I'm in here because he showed up in my life. I'm in here because he called my name. I'm here because I know Jesus is real more than I know this desk is real. I know he's a heart fixer. I know he's a mind regulator. I know he'll fight my battles. I know he picked me up. I know he cleaned me up. I know he rescued me. I know he makes ways. I know Jesus. 
you know, that's why, that's why when we call, when we call religion a faith, a faith, it's, it is faith, but it's based in a fact. You see, some people think that this thing is all about faith, but God has not called you to just have blind faith, but he's called you to have faith based in a fact. And my fact is, I know that Jesus is real. You can't, you can't change that for me. I know I met him. I know he got up. I may not know all of how the Bible came together. And I may not know all of how the Christian church has formulated its customs. I may not know everything about Enon, but I know who Jesus is. And I know where I was when I met him. And I know what he's done in my life. And can I stay right here for a minute? I know why I'm standing here today. It is nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm about to preach myself happy when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me. How he blessed me and how he kept me and how he made ways for me. And because of that I know that he that has begun a good work he started a good work. He started something in me and didn't bring me this far to leave me right now. Listen, you got to be confident. You got to be confident. And I am confident. But my confidence is not in me. My confidence is in Christ. Now let me, let me muddy the water a little more because my confidence is uh, not only in Christ, but my confidence is this, that my thing is going to be all right. Uh, I know, I know you're struggling with that. Somebody is struggling because that sounds awful individualistic. But watch, and, and let's wrestle with the text. What, what does he say? He said, he that hath begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Did you see it in the text? He said, he, now we know who he is, that's Jesus. And that has started a work, a thing in you, shall perform it, the thing in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That means bring it to completion. He's going to see it through. He's going to make it happen. And he's not talking about all's well that ends well. He's talking about the thing that he's doing in you. Now, I know I, I got I to gotta be real careful. I got to be real careful because somebody just heard me say some stuff like name it, claim it. Because you heard me say, my thing is going to be all right. So I can name it, claim it, and yoke it, choke it, stab it, grab it. I'm believing God. But let me back on up. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the thing that God, through Jesus Christ, has started in you, meaning he told you that this is it. And he promised you that this is it. That thing he's going to bring to fruition. Now, let me make you mad. Because, you know, one, there, there is one approach. There's one approach. And many of you have seen it. And somebody will get up and grab, they'll grab a Bible. And, and I know you've heard somebody do this. Every promise in the Bible, I can just pick up and read and say, me too. I know you've heard somebody can say, somebody has told you, everywhere you see the word Israel, just take Israel out and put your name in it. And I understand, and I know, I know there's some good people that have said that, but you need to understand that there's, there's two understandings of word of God. There's Logos word and there's Rhema word. Are you with me? You need to understand Logos is the written word. And a rhema word, when somebody calls it a rhema word, it's because God has spoken that word into your spirit. So that there are a lot of promises in the Bible, but you don't get to claim that promise for you personally until a rhema word from God has said so. Ah, uh, you missed it. Let me see. You need to understand uh, that, that some of us run around here talking about, I'm believing God. But he ain't said it. So when you start believing God for something, you got to believe him for what he said. You can't just believe him for what you want. You got to believe him for what he said to you. And just because he said it to your friend doesn't mean he said it to you. 
So let me, can I, can I push it a little closer? So whatever your station is, you're single, you believe in God for the husband or wife. Well, let's make sure God said so. Or you believe in God, you're married and you believe in God for freedom. Let's make sure God said so. Y'all going to get mad at me. Some of us out here laying hands on cars that God ain't tell you he was giving you. Some of us are laying hands on jobs that God didn't tell you he was giving to you. Now, God is able to give you whatever he wants to give you. But you got to wait for God to tell you what's for you. And you got to wait for God to tell you what the assignment is. But here is the promise that whatever God says, God will bring it to pass. So once I've heard from God, once I know God says it's for me, that's when we begin to say stuff like this. What God has for me is for me. You need to understand, you need to understand that I'm not shouting about just indiscriminate promises. I'm shouting about the promises that he made me. Uh, let me see. I'm going to get on out of your way, but you need to understand some of us in here getting mad at God because God didn't do something that you wanted God to do. But God never said that God was going to do that. You need to understand sometimes we pray to God and God says no. Sometimes we pray to God and God says wait. We need to understand that there are times you're going to pray to God for somebody to be healed, but God has said, it's my time to bring them home. You need to understand that you're going to pray sometimes for God to extend the season, but that God says that season is over. That's why the real question of life is not how much naming and claim it I can do. The real question is, can I understand God's will? Can I get so close to God uh, that I hear God's will? Can I be so close to God uh, that I want what he wants for me? Can I be so close to God uh, that I pray what he wants me to pray? Can I be so close to God uh, that I know his will uh, for my life? Because once I know what God has said, it does not matter who's against it. Once I know what God has said, I can put it in my pocket. Once I know what God has said, there's no devil on earth or in hell that can stop it. Once I know what God has said, I know that it shall come to pass. So I stop by to remind you that it might get hard and it might get difficult but if the Lord told you that he's going to do it, you ought to start acting like it is so even if it ain't so until it becomes so because it shall come to pass I trust in God whatever be kind, God will take care of you I stop by to tell you that God can do anything but fail I stop by to tell you that you've got a reason to have confidence you've got a reason to trust God I trust him because of what Jesus did I trust him because he went up on a cross died for my sins got up early Sunday morning and because he got up I know that whatever I'm in God will make a way whatever I'm in God will bring it to completion whatever I'm doing God's gonna get glory whatever he's called me to God will finish it up that's why I've got hope my hope is that God will take care of me my hope is that God will fix it my hope is that God will fight my battles my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and his righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus name on Christ
The solid rock I stand All of the ground All of the ground Is sinking said my hope My hope My hope The reason I got up this morning the reason I'm not afraid, the reason I can look the devil in the face, the reason I get ready to go one more time is because my hope is in Jesus. My hope is in something I can verify. I can verify that Jesus is real. Because I was there when he saved me. If I had time, I would remind you, you know, do you know what the role of miracles in the Bible are? Whenever you see a miracle or a theophonic experience, those are really for people to bolster their faith. There are times that, that Jesus will do a thing or show himself or send an angel or have an experience that is miraculous. And that is for your proof that he is who he said he is. It's to teach a principle and show your proof. Now, we don't walk around seeing miracles every day. Jesus doesn't show up. I, I often tell this story. When I was in seminary, I accepted my call to ministry. Three months later, I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. Don't know anybody. I just know I, I, I met the Lord and he called me into ministry. For that first semester, I, I tell this story and some people think that I'm crazy. Every night that I went to bed in Manly Hall, every night that I went to bed, angels came in my room. It was as if they just floated and it was a presence. It was a way, there was, there was, it's a theophonic experience, that's my theological language, but that was real. Now, angels don't always float around my house anymore, but I remember those moments. And in those moments when I feel like quitting, those moments when God's voice is not as clear, those moments when it gets hard, that's one moment I go back to, I remember. And I remember God called me to do this. And so I know that whatever he called me to do and, and be in, in this moment, it's going to come to pass. I want to challenge you to think about those moments. It's not all the time, but those moments that the Lord has shown you so clearly that he's real. Sometimes you got to go back to those moments. And remember that that's the one who brought you right here. And if he is the one that brought you here, he's not going to let this thing kill you. He's not going to let this thing detour you. He will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And you've got the proof because you were there. You were there when he picked you up. You were there when the miracle happened. You were there when you were the only one in the room that heard that voice. That same person is here right now. As bad as it looks in the street, as bad as it looks uh, maybe in your situation right now, just go on back and remember that, that day. Because the one who did that day is with you today. And it shall come to pass. Listen, I don't know who I'm talking to, but there may be somebody who is ready to throw in the towel, ready to give up, ready to be mad at God. Listen, I'm here to tell you that if you text Enon Prayer to 84576, somebody will reach out to you to pray with you, to encourage you. If you want to come into the life of the church, you can text Venon to 84576. We'll process with you to bring you into the life of this church. I want to encourage you to not give up. Some of us are getting tired of all of the shuddering in place and all of the challenges that come with this. And we're not near the end of it, no matter what that president says. We haven't rounded a corner. It's not safe yet to come out. We need to stay in our homes. We need, uh, unless you have to go out, and if you do go out, you need to have on a mask and you need to practice social distancing. And we need to expect that this year is a wrap and we need to expect that we're going to have the arduous task of balancing children in virtual spaces and challenging jobs and changing jobs. We need to expect that all of that is real. But guess what's more real? He 
who began a good work in you. And if he said it, this may have caught us by surprise. It ain't catch him. Do you know, and we can wrestle with this at another time, that God knew about the coronavirus when God said, let there be light. God didn't learn something new on January 7th when Donald Trump learned how dangerous it was. God already knew. And you need to understand that God knows what we're dealing with and God knows how to preserve us in this moment. I want you to trust him with your soul. Trust him with your life. Start acting like it. Start acting like you're the head and not the tail. Start acting like you're above and not beneath. Start acting like, y'all remember that illustration? Start acting like you coming to the park when all this is over and you're going to see Rev playing with UGO. Start acting like it because it's going to happen. It shall come to pass. God, I thank you for the word. I thank you for my brother and my sister who is making a decision for you today. I thank you, God, that even though life is rough right now and even though we can't see the end, we can see you. And that's enough for us. So God, we ask that you hold on to us. Help us to understand you. Help us to line up our faith with your facts. Lord, I pray for the person under the sound of my voice who's getting weak and weary. And I pray that you be the lifter of their head. Lord, we know that we are facing some dark and difficult days, but we know you. And so we trust you. You will bring it to pass. Now, God, as we get ready to leave this place, but never from your saving grace, Lord, we would that you give us traveling grace until we meet again. We ask it in the matchless, marvelous, and majestic name of Jesus the Christ. And for his sake we do pray. Let every heart say amen, amen, and amen, amen.